Today we are going to be talking about microscopes. Uh, so topic three is um, kind of an introduction to how we can study cells and uh, depending on the semester sometimes I'm lucky enough that it's a little bit earlier and, and it's uh, before the labs and and uh, get a chance to talk about some of these things about microscopes and whatnot before we actually see them. Uh, this semester is a little unique obviously with the on online nature and all that but we will be uh, having an introduction to microscopy in this week's lab as well so hopefully it kind of gels together and some of the information that uh, we're going to talk about today is going to be relevant to uh, what you're going to see on Thursday's lab. So let's talk about um, microscopes and uh, we'll talk about a few other things but most of those other things will probably be on next day's lecture. Today we'll be uh, focusing exclusively on microscopes. So this is uh, an image I showed you before or a similar one and we we're talking about what we can see with our eyes. And uh, when it comes to cells, it's not much. There are a few small cells like a human egg or a paramecium that are so small, they would look like basically a speck to our eyes, basically the smallest speck you can possibly imagine. And that is what uh, they would look like. So we need microscopes. And uh, there are many types of microscopes. We are gonna be talking about normal uh, compound light microscopes. And we're gonna be talking about electron microscopes. And we're also going to be talking about something called scanning probe microscopy, which for some reason is not in the textbook yet, but is becoming uh, very important. We're seeing a lot more of it now in the scientific literature, and uh, so it's something worth it to cover. So you can, you can see it from this diagram, it's showing that uh, light microscopy um, is going to cover a bunch of things we can see with our eye and then smaller. And uh, it gets down to basically bacteria. Electron microscopy, we can start to see things like viruses and uh, ribosomes and scanning probe microscopy in fact is really incredible you can see down and in some cases actually see atoms which is really really cool uh okay so hold on a second i'm just going to uh, turn my video off so i can see the full screen uh, video keeps blocking little parts on my screen so let's talk about a microscope uh you kind of need three things for a microscope and uh, if you think about it, we obviously need a specimen. So I'll write that down. Specimen. And there's my specimen down there, that little minion guy. Number two, uh, you need some sort of illumination source. Illumination source. And three, uh, you need some sort of lens something to manipulate that illumination source. Now notice I'm not using light because of course not all microscopes use light. Electron microscopes use electrons. But in the case of a light microscope, we are talking about light. And uh, you can see in that case, uh, what it's trying to show you is that the light will pass through or around the specimen. It gets manipulated in the lens and uh, you end up with an enlarged image, which is either on your eyeball or a camera or maybe a photograph paper or something like that. So we've already talked about some different types of microscopes. I've shown you pictures here. This one on the left is the Van Leeuwenhoek microscope. And um, if you take a look at this, I showed you it was really just a very sophisticated magnifying glass. That there is the lens. And then everything else is just a frame. And the frame uh, you can adjust using those uh, screws and levers. Uh, you can try to focus something by bringing a little bit closer or a little bit further away from the lens. And he was just using natural light, the sunlight, to, uh, to see what he was looking at. The one in the middle is a replica of a Hooke's microscope. Uh, it's actually a compound microscope. There's actually two lenses. There's an ocular lens up here and an objective lens up here. This thing right here is an oil lamp. So uh, he's um, using artificial light uh, to light the specimen and get a better look at it. And then the thing on the right is uh, uh, basically a multiple lens object objective uh, microscope. And you can see here we've got objective lenses and there's, there's three different ones. And uh, if you're in the lab with me, you should be able, you'll be able to see uh, um, the different objective lenses we have. And uh, I'll let you know hopefully in another uh, week or two whether we're able to do one in-person lab or not. I'm still waiting for, uh, to see if I can get permission on that. Uh, and I'm hoping that would be lab four. Uh, to get an idea of when that might be. 
So a bit more on that later. So uh, this is kind of showing the inside of a compound light microscope. And uh, really what you're looking at is, is, uh, is lenses and they're put together in a way to see the image clearly and hopefully uh, at the magnification that you want. Um, most modern microscopes, you can see that there's a, there's a prism here and the idea is to bend the light at an angle. Uh, it, it's just more ergonomic. Uh, to have the light coming at your eyes rather than having the entire microscope being this giant vertical column. The whole thing is a lot more comfortable. Some of them have two eyepieces and so on. You can see down here, uh, most modern microscopes, of course, plug in and they have batteries uh, with artificial lights. And sometimes there are these uh, lenses down here at the bottom that will actually focus the light onto the specimen. The specimen is found right here at the slide. So I'll uh, be showing you one of our microscopes in the lab um, this week once I get a chance to uh, finish making my video and you can see what, uh, what the microscopes we have look like. I think I have a picture or two in, um, in these slides here too. Ah, there it is right there. So this is Zeiss, I believe that's a German company and they make these microscopes and that's the one that we have in the Biology 107 lab. Um, so they're pretty mi nice microscopes for, and uh, they're, they're actually pretty common student microscopes, relatively durable, uh, not indestructible, but uh, they work, uh, they usually work really quite well. So one thing we're gonna be talking about a little bit uh, when we get to lab four, and something that uh, uh, if you get a chance to do in the lab, we're going to do something called oil immersion. So if you take a look at this here, um, something that happens when you get down to really, really small objects is you're not getting enough light to go through them. And uh, so what I'm looking at here, take a look here at this red um, light passage here. So the light is going to go through, and uh, this is the glass slide here. And uh, unfortunately, when light goes from one medium to another, uh, it bends. And you probably know that, you know, you've seen ripples in water and, and things look a little warped underwater, and that, that's because light bends. And uh, so when light goes from air to glass or glass to air, there's a little bit of bending and it scatters a bit more. So the whole idea behind oil immersion is you actually put a blob of this stuff here. It's called immersion oil. I'm not sure what's in it. And it has a very similar refractive index to the, uh, to the glass slide. And uh, so instead of what's going on in that red beam of light, we've got this blue beam of light. And uh, the light passes uh, through the object and, and more of the light ends up up here in the objective lens. So just kind of one of those little techniques that uh, is really cheap and, and easy to do and improves your image uh, quite a bit, particularly if you're looking at something super small like bacteria. So more on that when we, uh, when we do talk about looking at bacteria in lab four. So let's talk about uh, what we can do to get good images. Um, so I showed you this was our, our microscope here, right? And uh, I'm not exactly sure how much they cost. I think I heard a price tag of around eight thousand uh, dollars. So you know that's that's expensive. Um, you're not gonna you're not gonna buy them off the shelf at Walmart or something like that. But uh, that being said, um, you can probably buy a toy microscope from Walmart or Toys R Us or something like that. And so part of the question I want to answer is why is this one here better than the toy microscope that you're getting at Walmart? So one way to improve an image is magnification. And uh, so you probably know, uh, most of us have cell phones nowadays, and uh, you, can, you can maybe zoom in on an object and take a little bit of a better look when you're taking a photo. Um, but, you know, that's great. Uh, but sometimes magnification isn't necessarily everything. Uh, how do we improve magnification? Well, uh, you may know that uh, if somebody has a, a real camera with one of those big lenses on it, uh, they're probably going to be able to zoom in more and get a better picture than, better picture than your, your cell phone. And so magnification uh, really it has a lot to do with the shape, shape, uh, size and shape of lenses. So probably no surprise there. You know, people with thicker reading glasses, uh, they're, they're going you know, to be able to um, magnify better than somebody with skinnier reading glasses and so on. So on our microscope, we actually have different objective lenses. There's actually four of them in there. One, two, one in the back, three, and four. And depending how much you want to zoom in on something, you're going to uh, uh, select a different one. So let's address the issue of you can maybe zoom in on your cell phone, but the object is blurry. 
So that actually comes to the second thing affecting image quality, which is something called resolution. Um, oh, I guess I forgot to show you these are the different uh, lenses, objective lenses. So you can see we've got uh, 100 times magnification, 40 times, 10 times, and 4 times. So just depending on the size of object, you're going to choose it. So back to resolution. So like I said, sometimes you might zoom in and it just, it's just not a sharp picture. And that's what number two is, resolution. Resolution is the, um, uh, it means clarity uh, or the ability to distinguish two objects as distinct. So I'll show you an example right now of resolution. So take a look there. There's two images and you can see it's the same object. Uh, and uh, the one on the left has a resolution of two micrometers, and the one on the right has a resolution of 0 0.2 micrometers. So the question says, which microscope has a better resolution? So hopefully you are saying B. Uh, so you can see here there's a smaller number. So this means we can see smaller objects and we can distinguish them as unique objects. So both of them have the same magnification. But different resolution. So what we want to do is we want to see things that are nice and sharp, and uh, that's uh, that's obviously a huge advantage. There's a little cartoon for you. You can see it's the far side, and they're looking at uh, looks like a slideshow. And somebody says, "No, wait, that's not Uncle Floyd. Who is that?" Oh, I think it's just an air bubble. Uh, so clarity, clarity is very important. So. Um, the one question is, uh, so why is it that, uh, you know, an expensive microscope is going to be better than the Walmart microscope? So you're probably thinking to yourself, well, the Walmart microscope is made out of plastic. And that's actually um, the right answer. Uh, a big part of resolution has a lot to do with the quality of the lenses, right? So the quality of the lens material. So uh, for example, uh, plastic is bad, so let me just make a little chart here so we got best, I'll put worst over here. So worst is plastic. Okay, better than plastic is glass lenses. And then better than glass lenses are quartz. So quartz is a mineral and uh, all the best lenses are made out of quartz. They give uh, much sharper uh, resolution and uh, they're a lot more expensive than the plastic that would be used in a Walmart microscope. Uh, you can also use a smaller wavelength, and we'll talk about that as kind of the principle behind electron microscopy, but sometimes people will use UV light uh, as a smaller wavelength, and uh, sometimes that helps out with their images a little bit. So you can see we have magnification. We can improve that by having bigger lenses. Resolution, we can improve that by having better quality lenses, such as quartz. Uh, or I think, I, as I mentioned before, oil immersion helps with resolution as well. And then the last one here is contrast. So contrast, you can see it says here, is the difference between parts of a sample. So uh, shades of dark and shades of light. So we can improve contrast by staining some. I'll show you some pictures. So there are some pictures of some cells. And you can see the one on the left. Um, I can make out the nucleus. This is the nucleus right here. Uh, and it's not too bad. It's actually a really good image for something that's not stained. Often it's much worse. A lot of cells are, are kind of transparent and uh, they just look like their background. Uh, as soon as you stain it, you can see this thing is just popping out. I can see uh, the nucleus really well. I can see some of the folds of uh, the membranes really well. And uh, it just makes a much sharper picture. Uh, there's lots of different types of stains out there, literally thousands of chemicals that act as stains. And uh, most of them are interacting with something uh, due to some sort of molecular charge or, or something like that. So for example, uh, DNA is negatively charged. So there's a whole bunch of stains that have a positive charge on them that will uh, bind to DNA. Some stains just stain a little bit of everything. Uh, some stains stain proteins. Some will, are, are much, much more specific as well. So lots of different stains out there. I'll show you some nice pictures here. Uh, there's a picture of uh, this is an organism called uh, Giardia. I'll spell that for you. I really like Giardia because it's uh, really cool looking. It's got two nucleuses or two nuclei. Why do you have two nuclei Giardia? I have no idea. And you've got all those flagella. I feel Giardia looks like uh, kind of like these little aliens. Um, so cool picture. 
One stain we're going to talk about uh, when we talk about bacteria uh, is the Graham stain. So the Graham stain was invented by this guy here, Hans Christian Graham. And uh, this uh, is developed to, uh, to stain bacteria. And it shows that bacteria actually come in uh, two main types. They're called the Graham negative and the Graham positive. So we're going we're gonna to talk about this later uh, in the next unit and in the lab, lab four. Uh, but kind of just very briefly, um, gram positive means uh, that it takes up the purple stain. There's a stain called crystal violet, and the gram positive organisms are stained by it. The gram negative ones, they don't take up the purple stain very well, and so that's why they're called gram negative, and, and they end up getting stained kind of a pinkish reddish color. So, more on the gram stain later uh, when we talk about bacteria, which is, uh, I think we're going to talk about cell walls in the next unit. So, we'll get there soon. Enough. So I want to talk about uh, kind of um, something that's, that's used a lot more now, uh, that's getting much, much more popular. Uh, the prices are going down and the advantages are huge. And this is fluorescence microscopy. So you can think of fluorescence microscopy as using fluorescent stains. So a fluorescent stain it works like a normal stain, except for the fact that it glows when you put a light on it. So these are really cool. Um, now you're looking at the prices going up. Probably the cheapest fluorescent microscope I could find would be about $20,000. Uh, that's not too bad, right? Uh, you're not probably going to have one in your house for fun. Um, we don't have any at the college, although maybe someday we'll have a little more money and be able to, to buy one. Um, most hospitals might have one or two. Um, and uh, when you see the advantages, and I'll show you in a minute, um, you'll see it's, it's worth it, right? Uh, so you can see there's a second type of uh, fluorescence microscopy here, which I'll talk in a minute, called confocal. And now you're looking at $50,000, $100,000, $200,000, because you're looking at lasers, so lasers are expensive. You're looking at uh, expensive software and things like that. So this is showing what's going on. And if you take a look at this, rather than the light coming from the bottom, the light source is kind of coming from the side, and then the sample's going to glow. So that's kind of the main thing to know, is this is just, just kind of a fancy type of stain, and the stain glows. I'll show you some pictures. So there's uh, some bacteria. There's Staphylococcus. We talked about Staphylococcus before. Remember, Staph means cluster, Coccus means spheres, and you can see that really, really nicely. Uh, very, very sharp, good, good contrast. Uh, there's some epithelial cells, and you can see these images there. They just really pop out. They're giving us some really good information about uh, what's going on in the cytoskeleton of the cells there. Uh, there's Giardia with, with his or her two nuclei looking creepy as ever. And you can see we're using uh, different colors of stains for different cell features. So this is another thing with fluorescence that you can do that can really make the images look nice. You can stain, let's say, the DNA with blue. Uh, maybe um, it looks like the nuclear membranes with red and the regular membranes with, uh, with green in Giardia, and, and you can come out with some amazing uh, diagrams and photos. So there's some uh, spindle fibers here in green, and the DNA is in blue again, and we have some proteins. Uh, you can see those pink dots are proteins that are found in the middle. So very, very cool images. I'll show you a few more. We've got lots of great images here of fluorescence and confocal microscopy. Uh, this is a uh, a blood stain. So somebody is looking for the malaria parasite. And uh, so you can train a technician to do a blood stain and use traditional microscopy. Uh, the fluorescence microscopy is easier and it's more accurate. So sometimes it is worth it to invest in one of these microscopes. Uh, there's another one I found just somewhere on the internet. I thought it was kind of cool. I'm not sure what they're doing. They're making a rainbow cell. Um, I guess why not? So I want to talk a little bit about this confocal stuff, right? So traditional fluorescence, you can see, is shown here on the left, and the confocal is shown on the right. So one of the problems with uh, traditional fluorescence is uh, is sometimes focusing, and uh, you can kind of think of it as as uh, you know, um, if I have uh, you know, let's say uh, I'm holding my cell phone in front of my face, right, and I'm focusing on my cell phone. And everything in the background, like uh, across the street from me, is all blurry. And as soon as I focus on what's across the street from me, my cell phone goes blurry. 
right? And it's the same thing with microscopes. You can sort of focus on one part of a cell and another part goes blurry. And so sometimes you don't necessarily get the images that you want. So confocal uses lasers and lasers can basically go in and you can shine those lasers at very precise parts of the cell and, uh, and that you can focus on that exact part of the cell. And in some cases actually make some interesting three-dimensional uh, diagrams as, or images as well. So I'll show you some really cool uh, images here. Uh, and these are all, I believe, from confocal microscopy. So like I said, you're looking at about $100,000 or more for um, a quality microscope. Um, and these are from uh, Nikon, I believe. Uh, they have, I think it's an annual contest and, and they show some of the really cool images taken probably with their cameras. And uh, anyway, there's that one there, it's a skin cell. Here's another one, this is a tapeworm, the head of a tapeworm, and so those are uh, basically uh, suckers and hooks that are attaching to somebody, some lucky individual. There's another one, this is uh, some um, neurons, uh, and uh, they're all different colors and, and really uh, very beautiful. So as I mentioned, uh, with confocal microscopy, often you're looking at some relatively expensive uh, software. You can see in this case here, here's a case where they, uh, they took a, an image of a cell, and I think what they did in this case here is they took uh, you know, 300 images, and then the software kind of somehow blends them together and makes a, makes a sharper image. So one thing you can do uh, with the confocal microscopy, uh, in some cases, people have been able to map out things in three dimensions. So what you're looking at here is a mitochondria network inside uh, um, two yeast cells that are budding from one another. And you can, you can make out the, uh, the network uh, in three dimensions, which is really, really cool stuff. There's another one, just for fun, holiday lights. Okay, so before I get any further, and before I forget, I am going to make some notes here. So I think I had something like this um, at the end of the notes uh, in this topic. Uh, it said you can make a table. I can't, I don't, I'm not sure, I'm sure I haven't checked this table compared to the one there, but it's, it's something similar. And uh, so what I wanted to do was uh, kind of, you know, make a few notes around uh, light microscopy. And, uh, and then when we talk about electron microscopy, I want to come back and uh, kind of fill in that part too, right, to, for comparison. So let's fill in a few of these things, right? So illumination source for light microscopy, we're looking at light, right? Um, so we'll call it, well, I'll just say light and then I'll give some examples. So the light could be uh, natural, it could be a light bulb, it could be a laser, um, it could be UV light, there, there's all sorts of examples there, right? And uh, you know, it could be an oil lamp or something like that. So lenses, we talked about a few of the different materials that are used. We had quartz and glass and plastic. So viewing, what does that mean? It means we view this with our eyeballs. Uh, you can also use a, a camera. And the camera could be digital or it could be uh, old school film cameras. Uh, those are kind of the main ways to uh, look at things under a microscope. Uh, color, are things in color? Yes, we can see things in color. Uh, some of the techniques we mentioned. So we had oil immersion. Uh, what else do we have? We had fluorescence. Let's see if I can spell fluorescence today. No, I can't. Go spell check. There we go. Fluorescence, um, confocal. I guess we can't forget staining. That's an important technique as well, uh, regular staining besides fluorescent staining. So those are some of the main techniques. Cost and ease, so um, I'm going to skip over the, um, um, I'm gonna skip over the, uh, the Walmart microscope, but let's say you, you might be able to get an okay um, light microscope for $5,000 or less, maybe a used one. Um, Maybe, uh, okay, we'll just say a light microscope, maybe $20,000 for fluorescence. Why can't I spell today? I used to be able to spell. And uh, so confocal, maybe $100,000. We'll say give or take, right? 
But what is wrong with me? What is wrong with that word? Fluorescence. I forgot a letter. There we go. So these are just ballpark. Uh, you can spend way more if you want. Uh, the more bells and whistles you get, uh, cameras, those kind of things, it, it can get really expensive. Uh, but just give you an idea of what the ballpark is. So magnification of an object under a light microscope. Uh, it, it really ranges, um, but it's about up to a thousand times. And uh, we'll say up to maybe 2,000 times or a little bit more with some, some newer confocal methods. And uh, some of them, I can't remember what the terms they're using. There's all sorts of fancy terms. Everyone wants the, it's all marketing, right? They want to call it super resolution microscope and things like that to make you buy it. Uh, so what does that mean in terms of the resolution? Uh, in terms of the resolution, we're looking at... Um, somewhere on the order of, oh, I forgot my notes here, but it's somewhere on the order of 0 0.5 micrometers. So I'm going to find the micro. Uh oh, what did I do here? I lost, okay, insert symbol. I just want to use the proper symbol, that's all. Okay, there it is. Okay. About 0 0.5 micrometers, and if you're bringing things in nanometers, that's about 500 nanometers. I think there's some confocal that can get down a little bit smaller, but, um, you know, that's a good ballpark anyway. Okay, so before I move on, um, I will say that, uh, uh, and I think I did this last year, but one of my common midterm questions are to ask you uh, to compare different types of microscopy. So I think last semester I asked people to compare light microscopy to two types of electron microscopy. And uh, so, so these are some of the things that you're going to include, right? Uh, obviously uh, light and electrons, like what is the deal with that? Because that's a big part of, of what these things do. But another thing that you want to do is give me examples of what you can see under uh, the different types of microscopy. So if I was asking you to compare regular light microscopy, let's say with uh, uh, confocal or fluorescent, okay? Um, so talk about things that you're going to see under, don't under that microscope. Don't just say you're gonna see a cell. Okay, that's not specific enough. Uh, you know, normal light microscopy, maybe a gram-stained bacterial cell. Fluorescence microscopy, uh, what were some of these things we looked at? So you could say a fluorescently stained uh, mitochondria or something like that. Uh, so make sure you're specific, and uh, we'll see some specific examples of what's going on with the, uh, with the electron microscopy in a minute here. So let me switch back here, and uh, we'll go back to our um, PowerPoint. So there's the holiday lights. I think that's it for my, uh, oh no, I have one more. I just keep finding these absolutely gorgeous pictures of cells, and this one is super cool. You can see that giant nucleus up there, up close and personal. And all those mitochondria are those uh, little uh, spindly, uh, uh, spaghetti-like yellow things. Okay, so we can improve our images by a bunch of things. We can have uh, bigger and better and better lens materials. We can use staining. Uh, but there is a limit to light microscopy. There's a point where we just, you can't see things any better. You know, maybe you can use that light microscopy to see the, the Golgi body but you can't make any details. So if you want to get a really good look at things like organelles, um, a light microscope is not going to do the job. And so this is where electron microscopes come in. So let's talk about electron microscopes. Um, they're very, very interesting. Uh, and I've had a chance to use a couple of them in my travels, and I'll talk about those for a minute. But if you take a look, this is visible light. And uh, it, uh, it, that's the wavelength, visible light, right? And if you look at uh, electron waves, uh, the wavelength of electron waves is a lot smaller. So in theory, if you can have something other than visible light, something with a smaller wavelength, so electron waves, we can see smaller objects. And that's the whole idea behind electron microscopes. So they were developed um, beginning in the 1930s. And um, I think there's actually a University of Toronto uh, story behind this. So there's a Canadian connection to the development of the electron microscope. And, uh, if you see, it's, it, you've really got the same idea. On the left, here's the light microscope. You've got light, it's going through a condenser lens, 
going through a specimen, eventually an objective lens, and eventually to an eyeball. This electron microscope, you can see rather than uh, having a light bulb, we have this thing here, which is an electron gun. Uh, don't ask me how that works. It shoots out electrons and uh, they form a beam. And rather than having a lens made of quartz or plastic or glass, we have these lenses here and they're made out of magnetic fields. And so they can focus those electrons. The electrons either go through or bounce off of the specimen and you're not gonna put your eyeball in there. Uh, it'll zap your eyeball right off. Uh, but you might have some sort of digital camera or um, uh, a photo photograph film or something like that and you're gonna get your image. So I wanna talk about two types of electron microscopes. The first type is called SEM. So you can see that stands for scanning electron microscope. So here, right here, this is, the, um, this is the microscope that I used at the University of Guelph. And uh, it is old. Uh, it was purchased in the 1980s. And uh, um, it, it was very old, but you know, these things are expensive. And uh, I'm not sure what the price tag was on this particular microscope uh, in the 1980s. But if I wanted to buy something like this today, uh, you're looking at about half a million dollars. And uh, so what you're looking at right here, uh, by the way, this is the microscope right here. That's kind of mostly it. This kind of thing here, this is the control panel and an ancient computer. <laughs> uh, believe it or not, there's actually over here not shown, there was just kind of a normal desktop computer attached to it. I still use these controls here, right? This keyboard and these controls, these are for focusing and those kind of things. But uh, that thing on the left is, is the main microscope. So I was trained, I think it took about two days to train me to use it. And the, the technician actually, her office was in the next room. So it wasn't a big deal if I had any issues using it. And uh, I'll show you my, my images. So these are some of the images that I took using the scanning electron microscope. You can see this is um, actually an organism uh, kind of like E. coli. This is called something called Pseudomonas aeruginosa. And uh, the wild type are up over here. You can see they look like pretty typical rod-shaped cells. I have some uh, kind of sick cells here. These are my mutant babies, these blue ones here. And uh, so I made a genetic mutant and you can see they show up as a kind of a different shape and size. And, uh, but one thing you may notice from these images is that all of them except for the last one are in grayscale. So electrons don't have colors, by the way. There's no pink electrons or green ones or blue ones. They, uh, they're just either more of them, so you end up with a lighter image, or less, or you end up with a darker image. You can, add, you can add colors later, and that's what I did in the last one, just to make it look pretty. Uh, so another thing you may notice with the scanning electron microscope is we are looking at a three-dimensional surface of this thing. So what happens is that when you uh, prepare your specimen, and I'll talk about that in a minute, is you coat the specimen with uh, some sort of heavy metal. So gold is pretty commonly used. Uh, gold is cheaper than platinum. And uh, heavy metals, they have lots of electrons. So it's kind of like staining something, right? Uh, lots of electrons, lots to interact with the electrons in the electron gun. So they kind of bounce off the surface and, and then you get your, get your image. Uh, lots of people, uh, particularly on the internet, have done all sorts of insects and parasites and interesting things. And uh, I really wish I had done a bug back when I was on it because look at these images. These things are horrifying. We're talking about uh, these things must have inspired some science fiction movies. Uh, that hookworm on the left, those, that, I mean, that's just scary. I would not want to meet it in a, in a back alley, that's for sure. Um, so there's, there's another image. Uh, like I said, the colors can be added later. Here's our coronavirus. Uh, this is one of the earlier images of it uh, infecting a cell. And you can see that one on the left. It's a nice, it's a nice image. Um, but the one on the right, uh, look at that. The colors, they just, it just pops out. You see those virus particles really sharply. And uh, it really uh, makes for a much better image. Here's another one, uh, another virus. This is HIV infecting a white blood cell. And uh, you can imagine if this was all in gray, it would be a lot harder to see those virus particles. So it's, it's nice that they did this, right? And you see this in a lot of textbooks. They uh, colorize these things, uh, give us a much better image and uh, make things more attractive. Uh, some of these are stunning. Uh, this one here, again, somebody done E. coli and uh, some really nice images here. I keep finding great images. Salt and pepper. 
Uh, National Geographic photo, pho photography contest. Somebody decided to do something a little different. We did a salt crystal and a peppercorn and a uh, really, really nice image. So let's talk a little bit about the sample preparation. Uh, you can see there's somebody with a mosquito on a set of tweezers. And one of the first things to do is to coat them with gold. Uh, I have no idea how that works, uh, except for we use the sputter coater. So I would take my samples, you put them in the sputter coater, and you press start. It takes about 60 seconds, and somehow it sprays gold onto your specimen. It's not expensive because it's a very thin layer of gold, right? And uh, uh, it, uh, it really doesn't take much at all. But I like to imagine that this image here is just a little shinier. So you can see that mosquito is on a little, uh, little platform. Then it goes into the microscope. You can see it's got a big door. And uh, the reason for that is the specimen is going to go in there under vacuum. It's very important it's under vacuum because, of course, the air has electrons. And if there's air in there, it's going to mess with the image and uh, make it blurry. So it's important that all the air is pumped out, which is why you've got this big durable door. And uh, you're going to stick your specimen in there. So there is the mosquito. And uh, you can really zoom in on these things. So take a look. Zooming in on one of the hairs. You can actually see some texture in the hair. You can zoom in even more and look at that. We're actually starting to see some individual protein fibers uh, in that mosquito hair. And uh, look at that. Those are the individual proteins. Uh, so you're seeing some really amazing uh, detail using a scanning electron microscope. There's our frangiardia again. And you can actually see some of the nuclei. It looks like they're almost trying to bulge out of the side, which is. Uh, you know, makes them even more creepy. There are some red blood cells, and uh, it looks like some platelets and maybe some white blood cells. So again, a really uh, amazing uh, image there. There's some human chromosomes. So like I said, lots of really fascinating uh, images here. Um, I'm looking at this one. I think they, if you look at it carefully, you might be able to tell if it's a male or a female, if you can find the Y or, or two X chromosomes although that's not really my area of expertise. So as I mentioned, uh, electron microscopes can be used to see viruses. These things are so, so tiny. And uh, in fact, there on the left, there's the Ebola virus. Uh, it, um, big yellow thing is a cell. And the little blue stringy things are Ebola viruses. And you can zoom in on those and get some detail on them. There's a bacteriophage, and uh, you can see a little bit of detail on that virus. And, uh, this is something that uh, you wouldn't necessarily have these at every hospital. Maybe a research hospital would have a few electron microscopes, but a normal hospital would not. You're not using this for diagnostic purposes. You're using it because um, you're probably doing research on it. So let's talk a little bit about something called transmission electron microscopy. This one is a little bit different. We've got a T here instead of an S. And uh, so in this case here, I mentioned with the scanning electron microscopy, the electrons, they kind of bounce off and you get that 3D image. In this case, the electrons are actually going through a specimen. So there's a special way to uh, prepare a sample to make them very thin. Uh, they're also going to get coated with heavy metals, uh, tungsten, osmium. There's a whole bunch that are used, uh, depending on the technique that you're trying to do. Uh, so I had a chance to uh, kind of use a transmission electron microscope. Um, it, you know, it took a week to prepare my samples. And so I had a technician help me with that. And uh, she did kind of half of it for me because it was, it was uh, really, really complicated. And uh, it, added, it involved adding plastics and, and making them very thin and, and all that. And uh, when it came to uh, going to use the microscope, I got to see the microscope. I didn't get to use it. They figured I was only using it once. They, weren't, they didn't figure it was worth their time to actually train me to use it. I'll show you my images uh, here in a moment. Uh, but you can see that's what they look like, very similar to the scanning electron microscope, uh, although they kind of look a little bit bigger usually. They often have more powerful electron guns. By the way, uh, shooting electrons through things will destroy them uh, so your samples don't last long. And you hope you get good images off, off the top. So there's my images. Um, they're not amazing. Um, you can kind of see a couple of cells here. The membranes are starting to fall off. The cells were kind of sick, I guess you could say. Uh, and you can see uh, the spots there in the inside, I believe, are ribosomes. Uh, 
images didn't work out well and I kind of just moved on. Uh, it was too much bother to, uh, to work on this um, and I, I went off and did something else. I can't even remember, remember now, it just wasn't worth my time. But uh, I'll show you some nicer images. Uh, there is uh, from our textbook, uh, chapter six, you can see E. coli and they've colorized it. So same thing, you gotta add the color and you can kind of see, uh, actually this isn't E. coli, is it? It's something called the Cranibacterium. It's the one that causes uh, diphtheria. And you can see some of the features in there are a little bit better. Um, so these microscopes are used to see the inside of cells. We can zoom right in. Uh, you can see in this case, we've zoomed in and you can see uh, what you're looking at is two membranes, right? So this here is cell number one over here. And this here is cell number two. And uh, if you look carefully, you can actually see the membrane is a phospholipid bilayer. So your little phospholipids, right? They kind of look like this. And the phosphorus is, is, uh, has more electrons, so it looks darker. And it kind of looks like there's not much in the middle where the fatty acids are. So pretty cool. I'll show you some more pictures here. There's another one, this is an internal image of, uh, looks like some endoplasmic reticulum and these big red things here are mitochondria. So like I said, you're getting a lot more detail and uh, kind of that internal structure of the cell. We can also see viruses. Uh, there is the uh, pandemic flu virus on the left and the pandemic coronavirus on the right. Uh, so now we know what our nemesis look like. A uh, little bit different from one another. They are different viruses and people added different colors to them. But we can certainly see some good details on these things. So there's our transmission on the left, our scanning on the right showing the 3D, uh, 3D information. And uh, so just a quick comparison, there's E. coli with a gram stain, E. coli with a scanning electron microscope, and E. coli with a transmission electron microscope. So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna go back to our, um, our little uh, notes here. And uh, I have a Kahoot for you as well, and that's probably gonna finish up for today. So electron microscope, um, what is the illumination source? It is an electron beam. And not much more to say about that. Some are bigger, some are smaller. What are we using for lenses? We are using magnetic fields. What are we viewing it with? We're, you, we're viewing it with a, um, uh, I'm just trying to think what the, what the, uh, what the term is, uh, um, some photo something detector. We'll call it a detector screen. Detector screen, camera, or photograph paper. So that transmission electron microscope that I used, uh, used photograph paper. Uh, it was that old, and, uh, but we're talking about a million dollars for a new one or more, so if it still works, why not, right? Color, no. Although you could put a note, we can add color later to make it look nice. Uh, techniques, so I talked about two techniques for the electron microscope. We had SEM and TEM. If you don't remember what those are, you can look it up. Cost, okay, so uh, you're looking at, uh, maybe what I will just say is, you're looking at uh, half a million dollars, and we'll just say plus plus. Transmission electron microscope, uh, my understanding is they start off, uh, uh, you might be able to get one for half a million, but my understanding is they do start off at about a million dollars each. Magnification, so SEM. So SEM is up to about 200,000 times. I think in some cases, uh, there might be some techniques that are up to half a million times. And the TEM is about a million times. So, wow. And then the resolution, up to, and, um, I believe this is up to about two nanometers. So uh, in this case, that means we can see things like membranes, which are, you know, your average membrane is about 10 to 20 nanometers. So we can actually uh, see the membrane, not really a lot of detail, but we can indeed see it. 
Okay, so hopefully you got all that. Like I said, if you do see this on the exam, I might ask you, you know, what you know what you can see. Don't just tell me a cell. If you're talking about SEM, you can say the the surface of a cell, or you know, the a surface of a bug's eyeball, or something like that. TEM, you're seeing actual organelles on the inside of a cell. So keep those things in mind. So I'm going to go back to the PowerPoint just for a minute, and then we'll do our Kahoot here. And I uh, just wanted to show you a couple of uh, things here. This one here is apparently the largest transmission electron microscope in the world. Um, the Hitachi H3000. I mean, maybe they have an H4000 now. Who knows? Uh, this one here, uh, I don't know how much it costs. I imagine it's expensive. And you can call up Hitachi for a quote. So how big is this thing? What you're looking at here, these are actually handrails. So this thing is like tall. I mean, this, this is a doorway down here at the bottom is what you're looking at. I think I have another picture. Here's a woman here looking uh, up at it. And here's a guy working in here. So this guy here, he's probably highly trained. And uh, I've known a couple people. Uh, one of my friends at the University of Guelph when I was there uh, was one of two people that could do a certain technique in the world. And uh, so when he graduated, he got hired and snatched up right away because he was uh, very, very specialized for a really cool uh, type of technique. So if you don't have several million dollars sitting around, uh, I found this one on the internet. I think, uh, I don't think it's actually there anymore, so somebody bought it, uh, $50,000 for a used transmission electron microscope, um, but uh, these things are indeed expensive. So like I said, reminder, if you do get this on an exam, uh, you do want to talk about light and electrons and how that comes into play. So I have a Kahoot, I will load that up right now. It's not a long one, I think I have five questions and uh, that will wrap up for today. So here we go. Oh, I guess I gotta hit start here, sorry about that. Loading a pin. There we go, five, two, four, two, two, four, four. Oh, there we go. Now getting some players. Give you about 15 more seconds to join. Okay, here we go. Microscopy. Six questions. Question one, what is resolution? Okay, correct answer is the ability to distinguish two objects. So resolution is clarity. I, 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 maybe I didn't word this one as nice because um, of the word sharp, where people were choosing the word sharp. Um, I was trying to put a definition of contrast. Contrast really is the ability to distinguish between um, the edges of things and you know, where, the, where the edges are, where, where, where two different parts uh, finish and start. Um, but uh, clarity. So which really means being able to distinguish that two objects are in fact uh, distinct. So sorry on the wording on that one, all your losses, points, or maybe some pride, um, but uh, good luck catching up to Michelle now, everybody. Two, magnification can be improved by. And looks like most people got the right answer. Shape and size of the lens. Uh, using better lens materials, that helps to improve uh, resolution. Uh, but the shape and the size. Think of thicker glasses uh, are going to be for people with weaker vision because it magnifies things more. Question three, which of the following matchups is false?
Okay, looks like most people got the correct answer. So the first one there, light microscopy specimen is dead or alive. Um, I guess that didn't come up. Uh, in electron microscopy, you are killing it. You're treating it with a heavy metal, you're throwing it in a vacuum, it's dead. So light microscopy, on the other hand, you can, you can look at samples that are living or, or dead. Um, so sorry that didn't, uh, didn't come up. Okay, score, scoreboard is getting mixed up, that's good. Okay, question four, true or false, these types of microscopy are correctly ranked from lowest to highest magnification. Um, I guess we didn't talk about probe microscopy, so just ignore that one. So the answer is false. True or false? Transmission electron microscopy is useful for looking at the three-dimensional surface of a specimen. False. So it's scanning electron microscopy is looking at the 3D surface uh, image of a specimen. All right, one more for you, and then we're done for today. Sorry if I'm going a minute or two overboard. Six, what is the following would not be practical for looking at a clinical specimen, such as a blood sample? And there we go, I spelled fluorescence wrong again. So the correct answer is a scanning electron mic microscope. It is not practical because most hospitals do not have an electron microscope, uh, whereas the other two would be just fine. So, um, sorry about that. I think I uh, could have done a better job at wording these questions here. Um, so thankfully there's, uh, there's no real awards on here but uh well done nina and trevor and some mystery person up top and mark anyway thanks for coming out today uh, i'm going to stop there and uh that is good for today so we'll see you on wednesday